Okay, we're at the top of the hour. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Arpana Vanilla. I'll be um, leading the discussion in Q and um, we, we have, we're very excited to have Dr. Platt with us here today, but I'll let Dr. Tong Shen do the introductions. Hi, um, I expressed Oliver's um, regret not being able to attend this one. He's on the way, he's actually an NIH though. So. so I have the honor instead to introduce Dr. Francis uh, Platt. Professor uh, Platt obtained a bachelor degree, deg uh, degree in zoology at Imperial College London and a PhD in animal physiology from University of Bath. She was a postdoc fellow at the University of Uni uh, Washington University Medical School in St. Louis in the United States. And in 1996, Professor Platt was appointed as a senior research fellow at the Lister Institute of Preventative Medicine back in UK. And she moved to University of Oxford in 2006, where she was later appointed as head of the Department of Pharmacology in 2020. Professor Platt's research focuses on the genetic disorders known as lysosome storage disease just as what she will um, tell us more about it today, and how the abnormal accumulation of glycosphingolipids result in the pathology of such genetic disorders and how it leads to novel therapies. One major focus of her work is focusing on the development of substrate reduction therapy to treat such uh, lysosome disorders. And her work has led to the development of uh, market uh, approved by FDA by Europe, the drug for lysosome storage disease too. So she also has quite impressive, substantial record of all the awards. For example, to name a few, being elected as a fellow of Academy of Medical Sciences in 2011, uh, being elected as the member of the Academy, uh, Academia Europea, and also the, uh, as the fellow of Royal Society in 2021. So we have great pleasure to hear about the research by Professor Francis Platt today. Thank you. Great, well, thank you very much for that very kind um, introduction. So I th I, what I thought I would do today, first of all, thank you very much for the very kind invitation. Um, it's a real honor to uh, be invited to speak and it's sort of evening time here. So I hope that the phone doesn't start ringing or anything because I'm doing this from home. Um, the, what I thought I'd do today is just give you an illustration of a problem that I think a lot of us face in our research in sort of biomedical science. And that is how do you figure out what sort of processes are going wrong in a disease state? And how do you then use that knowledge to try and understand the primary disease that you're looking at and also if possible whether or not there's any overlap with other diseases because from a therapeutic point of view if you understand the sort of pathogenic cascade in a disease it gives you many more um, rational reasons for trying to target therapies and those therapies may have applications beyond the primary disease that you're working on. So I'm going to give you um, some experience of studies that we've done in Neiman pick type C, which may be a disease that you're very unfamiliar with. And so I will give you an idea of why we study this disease, what the fascination is with this disorder, and then how it's taken us on a journey that I would never have predicted in terms of how this disease links in very unexpected ways to a number of more common uh, disorders and how that's sort of influencing our approach to, to therapy for several diseases. So the, the group of disorders that we've studied for a number of years now are those that involve metabolic defects in sphingolipid uh, pathways. And the sphingolipid OCs are a, a good example of that. These are catabolic defects, lysosomal defects in sphingolipid metabolism, and they're rare single gene disorders. And I'll come back to this later in the talk, but I think that although these disorders are rare, the fact that they're single gene disorders gives us an ability to um, at least know where the pathway is starting from so that we can try and then dissect uh, the pathogenic cascade um, starting from a known point. It's very difficult to do that in things like, um, you know, Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's, where we're not quite sure what the primary insult is, what the contributing factors are. 
So although these diseases are rare, and obviously developing therapies matters if you've got one of these disorders, I think that the these diseases pay dividend in terms of um, knowledge that will allow you to tackle other diseases. Now, all of these disorders that we've worked on um, involve the accumulation of sphingolipids in late endosomes and lysosomes. And there's an example of some inclusion bodies. Uh, I don't know if you can see my, my mouse uh, pointer here, but these are inclusion bodies in, in, um, in uh, cells from a patient with Tay-Sachs disease, which is a, a one of the sphingolipid disorders. Now, they're, a group, they're grouped into primary and secondary sphingolipid uh, disorders. A primary sphingolipid disorder is where there's a lysosomal enzyme that's deficient that causes the accumulation of its sphingolipid substrate. So they're quite straightforward. But the disease that I'm going to focus on today is anything but straightforward. And it's a secondary sphingolipid storage disease. The primary problem is it actually in something um, that is not um, an enzymatic uh, defect in the lysosome. Now, again, I'm not sure how familiar you are with sphingolipids and glycosphingolipids, but they are an evolutionarily conserved um, family of lipids um, that you find throughout the eukaryotic um, uh, lineages. And if you look over here on the left, they, they comprise in the lipid moiety a sphingoid base uh, to which you can have um, an acyl chain attached. And they have different head groups. So they're ceramide based backbones. And you can have um, things like sphingomyelin with a phosphocholine head group. But the group of lipids that we're particularly interested in have glycosylation um, so that they're glycoconjugates, with um, the simplest one being uh, glucosyl ceramide. Um, but you can get these very complex um, charged glycolipids uh, carrying sialic acid residues that are particularly abundant in the central nervous system. So this just gives you a flavour for the fact that they are um, that their evolutionary complexity um, has uh, really mirrored the sort of uh, vertebrate evolution. And all vertebrate brains are dominated by these ganglioides. Now the biosynthesis and catabolism of these lipids is quite complex, but there are a few basic principles, so don't be um, too um, put off by this uh, complex diagram. The ceramide moiety is made in the ER, it's transferred to the, um, to the Golgi apparatus where the glycosylation reactions start. And glucosyl ceramide is the precursor for most glycosphingolipids. And this is actually added on an external leaflet of an early Golgi compartment. And then glucosyl ceramide is flipped into the lumen and can be acted on by other enzymes that will generate neutral and charged glycosphingolipids. There are vesicular and non-vesicular ways these lipids move through the Golgi stacks, and I won't go into that in any great detail. But suffice it to say is that most evidence suggests that glycosphingolipids primarily function at the plasma membrane. They can modify ion channels, they can um, associate into um, enriched microdomains, um, and we don't really fully understand what they're doing. And we've just had a Gordon conference on this topic, and we're still uh, debating their functions um, many, many years after their discovery. There are also um, interesting enzymes that can occur at the cell surface, particularly neuraminidase 3, that can remove silic acids and remodel these glycoconjugates actually at the cell surface. When these, um, these glycolipids are studied in terms of their half-lives, they turn out to be quite long-lived species, and they will recycle many, many times through the Golgi apparatus where they can be further remodeled um, by the transferases in the Golgi. But periodically these lipids get targeted to the lysosome through um, uh, entering the endocytic system and they are, they end up internalized on inner lysosomal or, in, or inner um, uh, endosomal vesicles, which is where they get broken down. And so you end up in the lysosome with a series of lipids that are being broken down sequentially and the enzymes are soluble and the lipids are insoluble. And so there are also a number of protein cofactors that help lift these lipids out of the membrane in order to be catabolized. And it's diseases in the enzymes in the lysosome that cause most of these sphingolipid disorders. Um, and these are primarily enzyme deficiencies. This gives you a more sort of biochemist view of um, these pathways. There are a series of sequentially acting enzymes, 
And there are four main series of lipids, depending on their structure, the O, A, B, and C. And again, I'm just highlighting the four dominant gangliosides that you find in the brain. Now, the question of whether these lipids matter for cell biology has been tackled in a number of ways. And it's been shown that uh, without doubt, you do not need sphingolipids for single cells to survive. So the um, whole pathway has been knocked out in cell lines and these cells are viable. So we don't believe that these are, they're not structural in the sense that the phospholipids are, they seem to be mediating higher order functions. And there were some very nice studies done by Rick Poyer back in the uh, late 90s, showing that if you knock out this pathway um, using um, genetically engineered mice, these animals die during development. And so he hypothesized um, that this embryonic lethality was because glycolipid structures are essential for um, supporting um, differentiation of certain key tissues. So these are really mediating higher order functions um, within the organism. Now, in order to study these diseases, you've got to be able to measure glycolipids. And for many years, we tried using mass spectrometry and we were able to use it, but it was insensitive and it wasn't very quantitative. And the biggest problem that we had is that we were dealing with tissues with many, many different glycolipid species. And each species has, you know, up to 30 different um, versions, depending on the chain length of the ceramide. And you need standards, as you know, for each species. And so we adopted a different uh, approach, um, which was to develop an HPLC method that ignored the lipid backbone, but really focused on the, on the head group uh, biochemistry. And so for this method that we've been using now for probably about 20 years, um, we extract the lipids, we cleave, this is the specific bit of this assay, we use a, a, what's called an, um, uh, an endoglycoceramidase, these are enzymes that are either bacterial or from invertebrate species, and they have the unique ability to cleave between ceramide and glucose, uh, which is the sort of the um, most of the, the glycolipids in the body are glucosyl ceramide derived. And so what this does is it, the selectivity for ceramide backbone glycoconjugates comes from the enzyme, and then you've got the sugar released. And then that released sugar can be labeled uh, with, a, um, with 2AA, and then we can then do normal phase HPLC separation. And what that gives you is essentially, this is for example, human plasma, where each glycolipid species is now one peak with pretty much baseline resolution. And the other nice thing about this assay is 100% of what's in there is in your profile. So you're not looking selectively at what you've got standards for. And if you have any unknown species, you can do exoglycosidase digest to confirm what they are. So this is the basis of the assay that we've been using. Where we want to know what the ceramide composition is, or we think there might be a change, we then use mass spectrometry. This method is published on Protocols IO if anybody's interested. And all of these methods for glycolipid analysis have pros and cons. And uh, this has served our purposes very well over the last few years. And we collaborate with a number of groups worldwide using this technique. Now, for many years, there was a dogma that you couldn't possibly have a biosynthetic human disease, because I've just told you that the glycolipid pathway, when you knock out the glucosyl transferase that puts glucose onto ceramide, that's embryonically lethal. But there was always the possibility that there might be biosynthetic diseases that were actually Golgi enzymes that were to do with the, um, you know, the sort of finer um, structure of those glycolipids where you might have, for example, a sialic acid that was missing um, or something uh, more subtle than a complete knockout of the pathway. And Andrew Crosby, who's a geneticist who's been working on old Amish populations, particularly in Ohio in the US, mapped a really interesting, very severe epilepsy disease. And what Andrew got in touch with me for was because the gene that he was fairly sure was responsible for this disease looked as though it was a glycolipid biosynthetic enzyme. And he'd read the literature and that he knew that that wasn't um, a likely bet. But with David Priestman in my lab, we analyzed uh, 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 plasmas from these patients and we were able to show that it was actually a GM3 synthase deficiency as Andrew thought. 
And GM3 synthase um, deficiency is in this blue box. You've got an enzyme that's deficient that basically means everything in this blue box is missing. And a few years later, he found another uh, enzyme deficiency in the same population, this time now um, a GM2 synthase deficiency. And it wasn't an epilepsy, it was a spastic paraplegia. And so there's likely to be more biosynthetic single gene disorders to do with um, higher order glycolipid biosynthesis. But so far, we only know of two diseases to date. However, the other thing to just bear in mind is when you lose an enzyme in these biosynthetic pathways that are sequential in nature, you don't really know whether the pathology is due to the loss of the complex ganglioside, the accumulation of the precursors, because in fact, the total level of glycolipids in those patients doesn't change, it's just the composition of those glycolipids. So is it altered distribution or levels? Is it a change in the neutral to charge balance in um, excitable membranes, um, such as neuronal membranes? And without that knowledge, which we still don't really have, it's very difficult to inform the route to therapy uh, because all of those, you know, depending on which of those answers is correct, or maybe it's a combination, you'd need radically different therapeutic approaches. Um, ultimately, gene therapy would be the answer, but at the moment, um, that isn't something that's um, on, on the horizon. So for the rest of my talk, I just want to focus then on catabolic diseases. We've known for over 100 years that there are a series of very severe diseases, human diseases, that are due to uh, lysosomal dysfunction, particularly in the enzymes that are responsible for breaking down glycolipids in the lysosome. So you build up glycolipids sequentially in the ER, in the ER Golgi, and then you break them down sequentially in a sort of reverse set of reactions in the lysosome. And some of these disorders are things like um, Sandhoff and Tay-Sachs disease, GM1 gangliosidosis, Gaucher. Some of these, if you're familiar with the Ashkenazi Jewish community, both Gaucher and Tay-Sachs disease have very, very high carrier frequencies within that particular um, uh, group. So if you look at the family of lysosomal diseases, not just the sphingolipid ones, but all of them, uh, which span all sorts of different biochemical substrates that accumulate, uh, there are a few general principles. They're all inherited single gene disorders. Most of them are autosomally recessively inherited. So you need to have a mutant copy of uh, the gene from both parents. There's about 70 or 80 of these diseases that have been described. And that 70 or 80 are accounted for by about 60 odd genes, because often there are subtypes of these diseases. They can be individually extremely rare. Um, you know, typical ranges are sort of one in 100, one in 200,000 live births, but collectively they account for about one in 5,000 5, live births. So paediatricians are on the lookout for these disorders. And most of them, about three quarters, are due to inherited mutations in lysosomal enzymes. And the predictable substrate accumulates and then it causes pathology through mechanisms that are not completely understood. But there are also a number of, the lysosome also has about two to 300 membrane proteins in the limiting membrane of the lysosome. They can also be mutated and also cause lysosomal storage diseases. And it's one of those that we've been particularly interested in, which is Neumann pick type C. Um, about three quarters of these disorders have really severe CNS pathology. These are progressive neurodegenerative diseases that often present in childhood. And the innate immune system is activated just as it is in, in Alzheimer's uh, with activated microglia. There doesn't seem to be very much of an innate immune response, but uh, that's still um, really under-researched in these disorders. And there are actually a number of approved therapies for these diseases, despite their rarity. And it's because we've actually got an exceptionally good set of animal models for these disorders. And at least we know what the causative gene is. So this is a schematic that we made for a review article that we published um, just before um, the pandemic. And this is just showing you that these diseases are multimorbidity diseases. They affect many different organ and tissue systems. And in each of these sort of green boxes, we have an organ like, you know, the brain or the ear or the lung. And each of these little uh, letter codes is a gene 
and several of these genes will crop up in different boxes. So if we just look at Neiman Pick type C, it's a progressive neurodegenerative disease. It also affects the lung. It also affects the eye and the visual system. And it also has uh, liver disease in the neonatal period and the spleen can also be enlarged. So you get the idea that these are complex multi-organ disorders and any treatments really need to be not just affecting you know, one particular tissue system, you need a holistic approach to treatment. Um, you know, so you need to be able to treat the brain and the peripheral tissues. So Neiman Pitt type C is a, is a really uh, fascinating disease for a number of reasons. So in many ways, it's a, a very typical lysosomal storage disease. It affects about one in 100,000 live births. It has cerebellar atrophy, which leads to ataxia. And these patients get dementia often in childhood or early adolescence, and they have Alzheimer pathology in the brain. The Alzheimer pathology is indistinguishable from sporadic Alzheimer's, except its location. You get plaques and tangles where the lipid storage is the most, um, uh, most um, highly concentrated. Um, but what's really remarkable is the cell biology of this disease is driving Alzheimer pathology that would normally take decades to manifest at a very early point in life. So there's a lot of interest in from the Alzheimer community in this particular rare lysosomal disease. Now, from this point onwards, this disease is anything, um, it, it, it really is not typical of a lysosomal storage disease. The first thing that's very odd about this disorder is that it's caused by mutations in two unrelated genes called NPC1 and NPC2. These are not duplicated genes, they're structurally and functionally completely distinct, but they're thought to cooperate in a common pathway called the Neiman Pick C pathway. And these genes um, um, account, about 95% of cases are due to the NPC1 gene, and about 5% of the families have a, a mutation in the NPC2 gene. These two disorders are pretty much indistinguishable clinically. And so one of the questions is, what's the underlying mechanism that makes two independent genes cause the same disorder? Now, from a sphingolipid and lipid biochemistry point of view, this is also a very, very complex disorder. So it's actually, this disease was, was classified originally as Gaucher disease, a, a glucosyl ceramide storage disease. Then it was thought to be a lactosyl ceramide storage disease. Then it was thought to be a Neiman Pick disease, as in sphingomyelin storage. Then it was thought to be a cholesterol storage disease. And the reason for all of these, these changes in classification is that all of these lipid classes are stored in this disease. And what wasn't clear is what's the primary storage metabolite. So sphingolipids and glycosphingolipids are also abundantly stored in this disorder. And one of the cell biological features of this disease that, that particularly lend itself to the cholesterol hypothesis is that there's specific failure of delivery of LDL-derived cholesterol in the lysosome. It doesn't move out properly to the endoplasmic reticulum. So there's a trafficking of cholesterol um, that's, that's problematic in this disease. And the other thing that's really odd about this disorder is that it has a fairly profound block in late endosome lysosome fusion. And th this is actually, we think, central to um, the pathogenesis of this disorder. The only approved therapy so far is substrate reduction therapy. This is the drug um, um, Miglostat that I've um, worked on early on in my career. And this is an inhibitor of glycolipid biosynthesis. So it's lowering the burden of uh, glycolipid substrates. Although there are also some other interesting ideas that we could maybe talk about later about how it might be working in Neiman Pick C that may be unrelated to substrate reduction therapy. So what Miglostat does is it's a small amino sugar drug and it blocks the glucosyl ceramide synthase, that enzyme that's sitting on the outer leaflet of the early Golgi. And that enzyme is responsible for moving, transferring glucose to ceramide. And then this feeds into the uh, Golgi biosynthetic pathway. So the idea is, is if you downregulate the biosynthesis, you can offset this impaired rate of catabolism. And the nice thing about Miglostat is that it's CNS penetrant. Um, so it's been approved for um, both Gaucher disease and Neiman Pick type C.
So I've told you then that there are two genes that cause the same disease. And where do the gene products of these two genes reside? Well, they're both lysosomal. Uh, the proteins are called NPC1 and NPC2 to match the gene names. And NPC1 is a very complex multi-membrane spanning protein that sits in the limiting membrane of the lysosome. This is not the cell we're looking at. This is just the lysosomal membrane. And the NPC2 protein is a soluble globular protein that has a cholesterol binding cavity. NPC1 has also got uh, the ability to bind cholesterol at its end terminus and in a sterile sensing domain. So the, there's clearly a cholesterol connection here. And the prevailing view of this pathway for many years has been that LDL derived cholesterol comes in through the endocytic system. Free cholesterol is generated, it binds to NPC2, and NPC2 hands off this cholesterol molecule to NPC1. And structural studies have shown very nicely that these two proteins bind different ends of the cholesterol molecule. So this all makes perfect sense. But what makes less sense is that NPC1 is then thought to basically export cholesterol out of the lysosome. And there are two problems with that hypothesis. One is that there are no cholesterol binding proteins in the cytosol that would accept cholesterol and move it to the ER. And also that if this really mattered for cholesterol egress from the lysosome, it wouldn't be going to any other organelles. And yet cholesterol is getting out of the lysosome in Neiman C, and it's going to, for example, mitochondria. So it's really a block in movement of cholesterol to the ER that's the problem in this disease. And so we started working on this pathway to try and better understand how to reconcile uh, this information. Now, I know that you're very heavily involved in uh, sort of metabolomic um, uh, approaches and metabolomics have been applied to various aspects of Neiman Pixie research. They've been very helpful for identifying potential biomarkers. And this is just one example of looking at, um, you know, patients with Neiman Pixie carriers and healthy controls in a metabolomics NMR study uh, with uh, Faye Probert and Martin Grutfeld in the, in the UK. And it picks up a lot of changes in, in um, lipoprotein metabolism and also things like elevation of isoleucine. But these omics platforms have not been helpful to us in trying to figure out the, the details of these pathogenic pathways. And so we've taken a number of other approaches. Um, it's not to say that we, we're actually doing some um, carbon-13 metabolomic studies for another reason to look at brain pathology in this disease at the moment, but it hasn't been helpful in the, um, in the story that I'm going to tell you today. But I just wanted to alert you that there have been some very nice studies that have been conducted. So we went back to basics with this and we decided that what we were, what we were struggling with as a field was that when you get a cell from a patient that's got Neiman Pick C, or you take body fluids from patients, everything that's going to have changed because of the, the mutation has happened and you're left with a sea of changes and you've got no idea about what led to what, you know, what's the hierarchy of these things. So we did a very simple minded experiment where we took a drug that has been known to bind to the sterile sensing domain of NPC1 and blocks its function, whatever that function may be. And so you can use a drug to induce pick C disease in healthy cells. We also replicated this study using silencing of the NPC1 gene. And what we did was we used HPLC methods to measure all of the sphingolipids that we knew were going to be accumulating in this disease. And we did a time course. And what was a huge, huge surprise to us was that one of the minor metabolites, sphingosine, which is the, um, the breakdown product of ceramide, was actually elevated remarkably quickly after addition of the drug to these cells. And then we had another surprise, and that was that the lysosome is the third regulated calcium store of the cell after the ER and, and mitochondria, has its own second messenger, and the lysosome releases calcium locally through two poor channels and TRIP-ML1. And we found that the luminal calcium content of that store that's normally around 200 micromolar had actually reduced to about a third of wild type levels. And this can be induced in cells by the addition of sphingosine. So sphingosine is in some way modulating 
the ability of the lysosome to fill with calcium from the ER. So this very simple-minded experiment had yielded two very surprising results within about the first hour of the experiment. This reduced lysosomal calcium then induces this block in late endosome lysosome fusion because the calcium released from the lysosome is the calcium source that's used for calcium dependent proteins that mediate fusion and trafficking. And it took about eight to 10 hours before we could measure a biochemical increase in cholesterol and glycosphingolipids. lipids. So we think that when the trafficking and the fusion is blocked, then everything just starts backing up. So this made us look much more carefully at what sphingosine's involvement in this disease was. And Doris Hoglinger, who's now a, a PI in Heidelberg in Germany, was a fellow with us. And she did some beautiful experiments making a trifunctional sphingosine uh, probe that was, was caged. You could shine light, uncage it. It had a cross-linkable group and a click handle. And what she was able to do was take the drug, take the silencing RNA, reproduce our time course, um, this time um, flashing light on the cells after they were loaded with this probe. And what you can see is in the control cells, almost immediately you can see a punctate pattern. Sphingosine is protonated at acidic pH, it's trapped in the lysosome, and it needs a transporter to get it out of the lysosome. Within 10 minutes in a healthy cell, it's escaped the lysosome and it's now in the ER. Now, if you use the U drug, which is the inhibitor of NPC1, you can see that there is this persistent punctate pattern. The, um, the uh, sphingosine is all trapped in the lysosome still. And we propose that NPC1 may be a sphingosine transporter. If you silence with um, uh, NPC1, you see a very similar thing. What Doris then did was she got three different um, patient cell lines. These were from Denny Porter at the NIH. Uh, this is a mild patient, a moderately severe patient, and a severe patient. And you can see that with increasing severity, you have increasing retention of the probe in the lysosome. So this is consistent then that pneumopix C1 protein is needed either directly or indirectly for moving sphingosine out of the lysosome. And remember, sphingosine is the precursor for sphingosine 1-phosphate, which is a very important signaling molecule that's uh, important in a number of biological processes. So having spent um, some time dissecting this pathway, we were able to start trying to understand how various treatment options were working and position them on this pathogenic cascade. And Miglostat may also be reducing sphingosine levels because sphingosine is generated when you break down um, uh, any lipids with a ceramide backbone, such as glycosphingolipids. Uh, it may also be acting as a conventional substrate reduction therapy drug uh, by reducing the levels of some of these stored gangliosides. But there are a number of other treatments that have been trialed, and the, this one, which is an HSP-17 juicer, has been through phase three clinical trials, and also cyclodextrin has been through phase three clinical trials for this disorder. At the moment, only Miglostat is, is an approved therapy. So we're now left with this, um, you know, we've, we've, we understand more at this point, but we still don't really understand what Neemanpix C1 protein is doing. Now we're very lucky that evolution has given us an awful log of NPC1 in yeast. And this has yielded a very nice um, structure that was published um, in 2019. Uh, this is not our work, um, but this structure was a really nice, um, gave us some really nice insights because what it was showing was here's MCR1, which is the ortholog of NPC1, and it has this tunnel that runs um, up into the limiting membrane of the lysosome. And it looks as though um, when NPC2 transfers cholesterol to this protein, it enters this tunnel. And the question really is whether or not this is a cholesterol transporter or whether it's a cholesterol regulated transporter of um, cholesterol and other substrates. And I'll come on to that in a moment. But what I want you to notice is there is no evidence from this structure that this protein is capable of spitting cholesterol out into the cytosol. What it's actually doing is moving things into the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane, of the, of the lysosomal membrane. And so this suggests that this protein, um, you know, the question then is, well, once all these lipids that are moving through this tunnel get to the outer leaflet, what happens then? 
And this is something that we've been uh, investigating. Another really interesting study that came out was that showed that if cholesterol is transferred from NPC2 to NPC1, NPC1 forms a functional confirmation, an ordered confirmation. But if you do this in lipid depleted media, or if you do it in an NPC2 deficient cell, NPC1 is disordered and it doesn't work. So all of these um, data that I've just been describing would be consistent with a cholesterol regulated function of NPC1 rather than it being a primary cholesterol transporter. Now for the lipid uh, biochemists amongst you, um, you'll know that very few lipids are moved one molecule at a time uh, through a, a binding protein. Most of them are actually moved very efficiently through um, membrane contact sites, through a variety of diffusion, collision, um, and lipid transfer protein mediated sites. So these lipid transfer proteins, uh, rather than having a protein that's an acceptor in the cytosol, and then that protein has to diffuse and find its target, two organelles come together and things are transferred um, at a distance over these membrane contact sites. There are many, many um, proteins that are involved in tethering different lipid compartments to each other. And this is just a very nice schematic uh, in the literature, whereas there are very few lipid binding proteins. So this got us thinking that perhaps what neiman pixie disease is all about is a problem of moving uh, lipids from the lysosome specifically to the ER. And so our hypothesis was, well, maybe that this is to do with a failure in contact site formation because lipids are getting out of the lysosome and going to other sites, but they're not going to the ER. So we wonder whether or not this is a, a lysosome ER membrane contact site uh, disorder. And this work um, is from uh, by uh, Doris Hoglinger, who did the beautiful work with the sphingosine probe, and Emily Eden, a collaborator at UCL in London at the Institute of Ophthalmology. Now, the clue to this uh, came from some yeast um, genetic screens that we've been, we've been conducting with Maya Schuldinger at the Weizmann Institute. Um, Ali Kaleso was an EU funded student and we had a very nice EU network together and Ali went and spent six weeks with Maya running a number of screens looking at um, the yeast orthologue of NPC1. And one of the screens that she ran was to look at whether or not biochemically NCR1 was forming a biochemical um, interaction with proteins that were on the ER of yeast. And what she came up with was a protein called LAM4P in her screen. And the mammalian orthologs of that protein are these gram D1 proteins. And in mammals, there's an A, a B, and a C. And these are lipid transfer proteins that are known to work at contact sites. So to cut a very long story short, if you go to the mammalian system and you um, immunoprecipitate NPC1, you can co-IP gram D1B. That seems to be the mammalian co-IP partner. If you grow these cells in lipid depleted media, so there's, no, there's less sterol in the system, um, the, the interaction is much weaker. And if you knock down gram D1B or NPC1, you end up with this um, loss of cholesterol esters, just as you do with the NPC situation, because these, um, these lipids and the, the cholesterol is not getting to the, to the um, ER for esterification. So this was consistent then that we had um, a contact site problem. And what Emily did was some um, electron microscopy staining with uh, an antibody in immunogold against NPC1. And she found that when you get um, immunogold uh, localization of NPC1, it was enriched at these ER lysosome contact sites. Now, when you look at the degree of knockdown of the actual contact site, so if you have NPC1 deficient cells, about 50% of these contact sites are reduced. So this is not by any means 100% blocking contact site formation. Um, and it suggests that there are some other tethering complexes. But what this suggested to us was that NPC1 was part of this tethering machinery itself and that it was probably cholesterol regulated. And it was then moving these, uh, facilitating the movement of these lipids at other contact sites. Now, Emily was doing a lot of electron microscopy and she contacted me one day because she was seeing some very common, unusual structures in her electron micrographs. 
that looked as though we had a bizarre situation of lysosomes looking as though they were internalized into mitochondria. And these are just three examples on this. Now, what, um, what um, uh, Emily does is some very sophisticated um, electron microscopy, and this is a Z-stack reconstruction. And if I run the video, you can see that actually it's not internalized. It's just that the mitochondria is wrapping around the mitochondria. The mit mitochondria is wrapping around the lysosome. They're still connected to the cytosol. And what this suggested was that when you don't form lysosome ER contact sites properly, you start now forming inappropriate contact sites with other organelles, in this case, mitochondria. And it's already been shown um, through some beautiful work by Barbara, Barbara Carson in Dalhousie in Canada, that there is a, an excessive um, loading of cholesterol into mitochondria in this disease. And you can see why, because essentially um, these membranes are in intimate contact and there's an excessive number of these within the cell. And this is just another version of that. So, so we propose then that there is a tethering role of NPC1 with the gram D1B uh, on the ER, and that this is facilitating movement of lipids uh, through to the ER. And in, when human PIC-C1 is deficient, uh, this doesn't happen. Now, the other thing that has given us a lot of insights into this disease is actually how it's related to other disorders. And you can, you can come across these links um, through basic science and observation, but you can also come across them through clinical accidents. And one of these clinical accidents was that um, there was a very interesting patient in Italy who was misdiagnosed as Neumann PIC-C. And she was put on standard of care, which is the Miglostat drug that we've already mentioned, the substrate reduction therapy drug. And her symptoms got remarkably better and remarkably better in a way that you don't see in a Neumann PIC-C patient. What this drug does in Neumann PIC-C is it slows disease progression and it extends lifespan of patients by about 10 years. It doesn't have a, a rapid dramatic increase in improvement in symptoms. It's really delaying the course of the disease. So a clinician, Bruno Benby, who's an expert in lysosomal diseases, saw this patient and said that she'd been misdiagnosed. He thought she had a, a late, um, she, he thought that she had an adult form of Tangier disease and confirmed that with a genetic diagnosis. So we then had a paradox, which was that this lady was improving on Miglostat treatment, but she had a disease that was nothing to do with Neumann PIC-C or Gaucher disease, for which this drug's approved. She actually has an ABCA1 transporter defect. So Ali Kaleso and Etchem Kaya, um, when they were in the lab, uh, started looking at what was going on. How, how was uh, Tangier disease and Neumann PIC-C converging um, as was implied by their uh, responsiveness to Miglostat treatment? Now, these adult onset forms of Tangier disease, it's, you think of Tangier disease as a, as a childhood disease with large orange tonsils. Um, actually, a lot of adults get this disease. Um, when I say a lot, it's still rare, but there's probably more of these adult forms than there might be of these pediatric forms. And these uh, adult forms have quite a large deletion, but they have a milder form of the disease. And ABCA1, as you know, is, is functioning as a reverse cholesterol transporter out of cells uh, and is involved in, um, in um, um, HDL uh, formation. So why was ABCA1 patient responsive to Miglostat? Well, we biochemically profiled Tangier disease cells, and we discovered that they've got all of the hallmarks that we see in Neumann PIC-C. So they've got sphingosine storage. They've got this reduced lysosomal calcium content. These are two Tangier cells compared to an NPC cell. This is wild type. This is releasing calcium just from the lysosome. So this was very indicative that there was some convergent cell biology going on here. And I won't wade through all the data, but suffice it to say, everything that we see at the cellular level in Neumann PIC-C is phenocopied in Tangier disease. A really interesting observation was that I told you that cyclodextrin has also been trialed as a therapy for Neumann PIC-C. And so we compared um, the response of Tangier disease patient cells. So we've got four patient cells here and here and a control cell here. And what we're looking at is the lysosomal volume of these cells, They're, so they've got lysosomal storage. And we're treating these four patients with Miglostat on the left, and they all show a reduction in storage consistent with the clinical response. 
But look what happens with cyclodextrin, absolutely nothing happens. And this raises a really interesting possibility that the effectiveness of cyclodextrin, particularly in animal models of Neelanthic C, may be ABCA1 dependent. So this weird convergence of these two diseases has also shed a little bit of light on how one of the treatments that are being developed for Neelanthic C may be working. So the conclusions of this study was that Tangier disease is unexpectedly a secondary lysosomal storage disease. It phenocopies Neelanthic C1. Cyclodextrin is probably acting um, on an ABCA1 in an ABCA1 dependent uh, manner. And that the glycosphingolipid substrate reduction therapies like Miglostat, and there's another one now called Iliglostat, may be unanticipated therapies for Tangier patients. Now this matters because Tangier is ultra rare. It's an ultra orphan disease. There are so few patients that no pharma company will ever develop drugs for it. Could Miglostat be useful in these patients, not just this first case that we've looked at? And at the moment within the National Health Service in the UK, funded by the government, we have a marvellous N of one trial, uh, which is, um, they're paying for the Miglostat and we're doing a study of a Tangier disease patient in Birmingham. This is one of Tarek Highwatt's patients and Kerry Wallom in my lab is analysing his cells over time. And if this shows efficacy, then um, off-label prescription use of this drug in other Tangier patients will probably happen. It's a wonderful example of one patient in a team of about 20 people through the Southampton Clinical Trials Unit who are monitoring this um, basically clinical experiment. And I think this is a nice example of how you can be quite creative with clinical trial design in the um, rare disease space. And hopefully this, this case will inform um, and hopefully promote access of this drug to other patients who might benefit from it in the future. Now, I want to also mention that ABCA1 and, and Neiman Pick C was already slightly on our minds, at least ABC transporters were, because when Ali went to Maya's lab and did her uh, yeast screens looking at interactors between the yeast vacuole and the um, ER that were mediated by NCR1, she'd done another screen where she just looked at interactors on the vacuole itself. So in other words, she was looking for proteins that complex with NPC1 uh, might function with it. And what she found was that NP NCR1 is in a complex with four other proteins. Um, there are the, this is a, a cell cycle related protein. This is the equivalent of ferritin in yeast. This is very interestingly a calcium transporter. And that calcium transporter is complex with an ABC transporter. So we're wondering whether or not there's cooperativity in the lysosomal membrane of NCR1 and this um, ABC transporter. So there may be a mechanistic uh, requirement for both NPC1 and an ABC transporter in order for all this lipid uh, transport machinery to be fully functional. So I'm just um, flagging that as, a, um, as a, something to just uh, have at the back of your minds. Now, the other really unexpected convergence of Neiman Pick C is with infectious diseases. And the thing that put NPC on the, on the map briefly uh, was the fact that it was discovered to be the Ebola virus receptor. And it's the first viral receptor that's intracellular. Most viruses interact with a receptor at the plasma membrane. But in fact, Ebola interacts with the plasma membrane very nonspecifically, gets internalized into the endocytic system, it gets into the lysosome and it's got to very, very rapidly get out of the lysosome. And two factors have been found to be critical for this. This is the, uh, one of the um, domains of the surface uh, envelope glycoprotein um, on Ebola virus, and it inter interacts specifically with the second luminal loop of NPC1. And it requires a functional NPC1 protein in the lysosome for it to then bind and then escape out of the lysosome to replicate in the cytoplasm. The other really interesting thing is it also needs calcium release from the lysosome as a cofactor. So this is um, shedding a lot of interesting cell biological light on Ebola. And one of the questions that we're very interested in is why has Ebola evolved to target this protein when there are 300 other uh, membrane proteins in the lysosome? Could it have something to do with that? Uh, relationship with calcium mobilization. 
Uh, we don't know, but it's something that we're studying with collaborators. But the thing that we also discovered was that when we were working out all these cellular features of Neiman Pixi disease, um, the accumulation of cholesterol, which is a really prominent hallmark, makes macrophages in Neiman Pixi patients look very much like classical foamy lipid laden macrophages. And they're superficially very similar to the kind of lipid laden macrophages that you see following mycobacterial infection. So um, MTB, for example. And what made us really investigate whether or not this, you know, you could argue, well, you know, this is a completely different mechanism. It's got nothing to do with Neiman Pixi. But what made us persevere with this and pursue it, and this was work that was started by Emil Lloyd Evans when he was in, in the lab, was that it was attractive to us that if you were a pathogenic mycobacterium and you evolved a mechanism where you could inhibit NPC1, you would drop the levels of um, lysosomal calcium, which would block fusion of the phagosome and the lysosome. So we could see a potential selective advantage. And Yuzi, Dawn and Nick and uh, Paul Finneran have all worked on this project over the last few years. And it's turning into a really fascinating story. So we, to cut a long story short, very much like the Tangier story, we found that when you infect uh, macrophages, primary human macrophages with real MTB, or you do BCG, or you use other pathogenic mycobacterial strains, you replicate all of the cellular features of Neiman Pixie disease. And we published this a few years ago. And it's been known for many years that when you are infected with um, MTB, obviously it's taken up into uh, macrophages in the lung, and you end up with um, a, a situation where infected cells shed cell wall lipids, um, which can then propagate to other cell types. And, you know, if you think sphingolipid biochemistry is um, uh, daunting enough, um, mycobacterial cell wall lipids are a completely um, another story. They're really uh, extraordinarily complex. Um, and it's been known that there are elements of these um, uh, lipids and glycoconjugates that are shed from these um, infective persistent mycobacteria. And so what we proposed was a model was of how we were replicating all of these pneumopic C phenotypes is when a pathogenic mycobacteria like MTB enters a macrophage, it sheds lipids. Those lipids inhibit the NPC1 protein, not only in the host cell that's infected, but also are moved to bystander cells that are uninfected. And David Russell has shown beautifully that by electron microscopy that labelled lipids from MTB um, are exported out of the cell and are taken up by neighbouring cells. And what that then means is that the phagosome will not fuse with the lysosome because the, there's not enough calcium release uh, from the lysosome to mediate fusion. So it has a protective niche. And the other thing, if you think about it, is that the bystander cells are now basically fully permissive for mycobacterial infection. The system is already inhibited in those cells. So um, the, the mycobacteria that infects this cell will be completely protected. The first few that infect this cell while they're establishing inhibition may be vulnerable, but they're not gonna be vulnerable in this cell. And so this is our working model. So we wondered, having sh um, shown that there was this cell biological convergence, We've done another study where we've taken um, an evolutionary perspective on this and we've asked the question um, how many pathogenic mycobacteria of the MTB lineage and other pathogenic mycobacteria may have evolved the ability to target NPC1 and inhibit it. And this is the sort of father genetic tree, if you like, of mycobacterium tuberculosis, different geographic isolates and strains. And the, there is a sort of an ancestral point of divergence where there's an ancestral organism called Mycobacterium kineti, which is pathogenic, but it's weaker than the modern uh, strains that are in these lineages one, two, three, and four. And you can see the geographic spread of these. So the beauty of working on this project for us is that we don't need the whole bug because we discovered that the lipids alone will inhibit MPC. So this is a lipid mediated effect. So we've obtained lipid extracts from um, several members of the um, modern mycobacterial tuberculosis family. 
and we've screened them for their ability to cause lysosomal storage. And to cut a very long story short, we haven't had many from lineage three yet, but we've had lineage one, two, and four. And the vast majority of these um, individual strains cause a lysosomal expansion, just like the U drug does that inhibits MPC1. But very interestingly, M. Kinetti, this ancestral um, strain, does not inhibit this pathway. So we think that the evolution of lipids that could inhibit um, MPC1 evolved after the divergence from M. Kinetti. We also found that M. obsessus, uh, M. avium, these are also pathogenic, have also got lipids. They're not MTB, they're related mycobacteria, and they also do the same thing. And I won't go through all of the data. We've gone through all of the other phenotypes of MPC to show that this is the case. But this is suggesting to us that this evolved um, at some point after the divergence from M. Kinetti. And one of the things that we looked at in our original study was, well, is it possible that a Neiman C based therapy may help clear pathogenic mycobacteria? And we showed a number of years ago that with the reduction in lysosomal calcium content, the problem centrally is that you're not releasing enough calcium into the local environment. So the local calcium content is not high enough to allow calcium dependent proteins that are required for fusion events to actually uh, obtain enough calcium to be functional. And we could circumvent that not by fixing the stool, but by compensating for the fact that you're not releasing enough calcium. And we could do that with Thapsigargin, which is a a circa antagonist, and what that does is it transiently elevates cytosolic calcium levels, and therefore it substitutes for what's not being released from the lysosome. And we found that there is a weak circa antagonist, which is curcumin, it's a natural product. And we were able to show that if, I don't know if you can see this, but in blue, we're staining these cells with philopin. These are RAW macrophages infected with BCG. It induces pic C phenotypes, cholesterol storage, and the green bugs you can see there. If you treat with curcumin, the cells are still there, and, uh, but the bugs have been cleared and there's hardly any blue staining. Uh, the cells really are there in the background. Uh, and what we've been able to do is clear those uh, intracellular bugs. But if we use Bapter AM as a calcium collator, um, those, we still have Philippine staining and we still have the bugs. So this was a nice proof of principle. Curcumin is not very bioavailable for doing this clinically, but we then took this into a zebrafish model and showed that if you infect larval zebrafish with um, M. marinum, which is a fish equivalent of MTB, it's an opportunistic infection in, um, in patients, uh, in humans that are exposed to um, water from fish tanks uh, in this example. Curcumin, in addition to the water that these zebrafish were in, allowed us to reduce the burden of these pathogens in these uh, fish in a 24 hour exposure. And Lita Ramakrishnan at Cambridge with Stephen Levitt did, this, did these experiments with us. So it gives you an idea that perhaps these very niche drugs for this rare disease may have unexpected utility for treating infectious diseases. Um, I just want to spend two minutes on other links to, uh, to pixi and lysosomal diseases in general. And one of the most interesting at the moment is that um, Parkinson's disease patients, sporadic Parkinson's patients, have an overrepresentation of heterozygous mutations in lysosomal disease causing genes. And Josh Shulman published this real landmark paper in 2017. Um, what Josh did was he took 2,000 sporadic Parkinson's disease patients with no known genetic etiology, did sequences on, uh, on these 2,000, and then looked for those 60-odd genes that cause lysosomal storage diseases. They looked for mutations that were known to cause lysosomal diseases in their homozygous state, and they found that over half of these patients had one or more lysosomal disease gene that was mutated, uh, and known to cause um, a lysosomal disease uh, when it's in a homozygous state. So these, if you like, are lysosomal storage disease carriers. And being a carrier with aging predisposes you to Parkinson's disease. And so we're really interested in what the mechanism of this is. It really suggests that Parkinson's is a lysosomal disorder. 
And it also suggests that some of these uh, treatments that are being innovated for lysosomal disorders may also ultimately show utility in Parkinson's. But this is very much work in progress, but I just wanted to alert you to this. And then of course, specifically in Neiman Pick C, we've also got this Alzheimer pathology. So can we use our knowledge, our growing knowledge of NPC to try and better understand what the critical events are in the pathogenic cascade um, in Alzheimer's that is driving this very early onset Alzheimer-like pathology in children who have Neiman Pick C disease. And so this is something where, again, I think studying the rare may help us inform about more common diseases. And so I think um, just to conclude, um, diseases with altered sphingolipid metabolism exist. There are two classes of them. There are the, um, the two biosynthetic diseases we know of, and then there are a number of catabolic uh, diseases. We're finding that there's more and more convergence between these rare lysosomal disorders and a range of more common diseases. And it's giving us insights into sphingolipid functions and homeostasis. And it's also giving us a new perspective on can we repurpose treatments that are being developed for rare into some of these more common diseases. And I think you'll agree that we could never have predicted that this very disparate group of diseases are linked to Neiman Pick C very specifically um, without doing these experiments and coming at this problem from many, many different angles, we wouldn't have realized the degree of connectivity that there is. And I think this NPC pathway is a real hub for some really essential um, lipid um, cell biology, but has also evolved as an infectious disease hub um, and is also obviously a clear risk factor for neurodegenerative uh, diseases. So I hope I've convinced you that simple monogenic diseases, as they're often described, they are simple at the genetic level, but they have an incredibly complex pathogenic cascade. And every omics study that you run on this disease or these diseases, you find many, many changes. The, in the, the case of Neiman Pick C, uh, we have contact site problems, mitochondrial dysfunction. There's a problem handling metal ions. Um, we've got nutrient sensing issues. We've got cytoskeletal changes. Obviously, sphingolipid metabolism is affected. Calcium signaling is affected. And we've also got ABC transporter involvement. And we've got this convergence with Tangier, possibly a new treatment for Tangier um, through Miglostat, convergence with TB. And we think that we could now trial some host targeted approaches in TB where we try and compensate for the calcium defect, uh, which will then promote phagosome lysosome fusion. Um, we know that Neiman Pick C is a risk factor for Parkinson's along with many other lysosomal disease genes. And very specifically, NPC is also um, accelerating Alzheimer pathology um, in areas where the lipid storage is most profound. And so we're very much looking to answer this question over the next few years, which is will NPC therapeutics have applications to other diseases, both rare and common? Um, I'll leave it there. I think I've acknowledged most of the people as I went, but um, thank you very much for your uh, um, attention and I'd be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Platt. Um, that was great. I learned a lot. It's important to highlight, you know, that like, like you said, even a simple um, thing like NPC can have such a, a diverse and um, a, a, such a great story behind it. I uh, learned a lot. Um, there's a few questions in the chat. I'll start off with the first one. Could you please elaborate more on how subst substrate reduction therapy works in this case of uh, Miglostat against uh, sphingosine, uh, uh, I probably said that wrong, and yeah. G GSL accumulation? Yeah. So it's a very good question. So what, what Miglostat does is it inhibits glycolipid biosynthesis at the first step, which is the transfer of the glucose to the ceramide. And that means that the cell is making fewer glycosphingolipids. So fewer are going to the plasma membrane, fewer recycling, and fewer are ending up in the lysosome for degradation. So in a lysosomal storage disease where you've got an impairment in degrading sphingolipids, if you make fewer of them, you can sort of have a little bit more balance in the lysosome where you're better matching 
biosynthetic rate to the impaired rate of catabolism. It's a bit like taking a statin to control your cholesterol levels. Now, how does that relate to regulating sphingosine levels? Well, if you have, sphingosine is, is generated when acid ceramidase cleaves ceramide into the fatty acid acyl chain and sphingosine. And so if fewer glycosphingolipids are going into the lysosome, less ceramide is being generated and therefore we might be reducing sphingosine levels. And therefore, because sphingosine is driving the calcium defect, we might have slightly more filling of the store. Now we've looked at this and we've never had a clear cut answer to whether that's true or not. The biggest pool of ceramide based glycolipids is actually sphingomyelin. Um, it, it, there's much more sphingomyelin in the cell than there is glycosphingolipids. And we've seen some cell systems where we treat with myglostatin, we do see a reduction in sphingosine and a slight improvement in calcium, but in other cells we don't. And it may come down to the balance between ratios of glycosphingolipids and um, sphingomyelin. But there's also another very interesting possibility, and that is that another target of myglostat is a, an enzyme called GBA2. And this is an enzyme that removes glucose from ceramide, but it's not in the lysosome. So this is like the Gaucher disease enzyme, but it's actually an, on the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane. And myglostat's a very potent inhibitor of that enzyme. And there is some evidence that um, it's GBA2 inhibition that might be beneficial in Neiman Pix C, but we don't fully understand the mechanism of that. So I, I've probably confused you more than I've enlightened you with that that answer, but um, does that answer your question, whoever asked it? Yes, and I, it makes sense because I wanted to, I uh, was more interested in how the substrate removal uh, reduction works, but to remove that, is it very specific for lysosome or is gonna overall reduce the um, group of glucosaceramides? Yeah, does so it have it's, side it's effect for that? Yeah, it's acting on an enzyme that's on the early gold gene, in fact. So it's inhibiting a, a biosynthetic enzyme. Um, so you put glucose onto ceramide on an external leaflet of the early gold gene. There's something about glucosyl ceramide that you don't want to be luminal. Um, galactosyl ceramide, which is very similar to glucosyl ceramide, is the, the main lipid in myelin. That's made luminally very, very happily by the cell. But there's something, there's some reason why the cell does not like glucosyl ceramide in the lumen, it very rapidly has to be flipped and converted to something else. So it's actually inhibiting a biosynthetic enzyme. It's not acting, myglostat isn't acting in the, in the lysosome itself. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question, in general, how does myglostat treatment improve NPC disease patients, especially NPC patients who usually don't live beyond the age of three? So most, um, most patients with Neiman Pixie, um, the sort of earliest, the absolute severe end of the spectrum would be patients who have null mutations and they die by the, about the age of four or five. But most Neiman Pixie patients present with neurological signs in childhood and in their early teenage years. And in the untreated untreat era, typically would die by about the age of 20. And with myglostat treatment, there's just been a, because it's now um, been uh, 10 years of clinical use of myglostat, and actually it's now a generic for both Gaucher and Neiman Pick C, there's been a really nice piece of data analysis done by uh, Mark Patterson at the Mayo Clinic that was published recently. And what it shows is if you imagine a, a sort of a curve of survival against um, all of the uh, registry data and um, natural history data for the disease. And you look at the patients who've been on myglostat, there's an on average a 10 year increase in lifespan. So what this is doing is it's slowing disease progression. Um, it doesn't rapidly improve symptoms. It's, a, it's really delaying disease progression. Um, and it's hopefully if it started early enough, is giving a much longer pre-symptomatic period, for example, in, in diagnosed siblings of the um, first case in the family. Um, so usually there's diagnostic delay with this disease. So the first child in a family will often, you know, present in childhood. It may take a few years to diagnose them correctly. And often other siblings have unfortunately been born into that family in the meantime. And several of those families have 
have the opportunity to not only treat the affected symptomatic child, but the siblings have also been put on Miglostat because they've got the same mutation. And although they're not clinically presenting yet, those patients have done incredibly well and they do much better because they've had a much earlier intervention. Um, so we've now got uh, individuals living out well into their 20s um, who are having a much better quality of life because of this. Wow, yeah, that that does make, you know, such a um, an improvement, I guess, with, to all those families because of that, that, that treatment. Um, the next question, out of curiosity, does BMP have any role in lysosome storage disorders since it is a lysosome specific lipid? Yeah, so BMP is a really interesting lipid because um, Conrad Santoff showed in very elegant studies over the years that BMP is in these inner lysosomal vesicles where those lipids are being degraded and it's needed to form. Um, so if you imagine the lysosome, you've got these um, invaginated structures that are sphingo, uh, glycosphingolipid rich and these little vesicles within the lysosome are where the lipids are going to be acted on by the enzyme. And Conrad showed that you, you have BMP in these membranes and it, it gives you the right lateral pressure of those vesicles so that these other proteins that help lift and present the substrate to the enzyme can work. So these are the saposins and things like GM2 activator protein. In Nemopix C, because the whole lysosomal compartment has expanded, you also see an increase in BMP. Um, I don't know whether there's anything specific about BMP um, in, you know, in terms of whether it changes its, its levels on a per vesicle basis or whether it's just that the whole compartment has expanded. But that's a really good question. Yes, BMP really um, is very, very important for this uh, sphingolipid catabolism. Great, wonderful. Um, I'd like to open up the floor for any uh, more questions from participants. Um, if you have any, please unmute yourself. We definitely have a smaller group now and um, open to, to you know, questions. You can ask directly to Dr. Platt. All right, yes, more. Shen, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I also like that uh, uh, the, the lysosome disorder story can expand to explain neurodegenerative disease, not only Parkinson's, also the pathology of uh, Alzheimer's, etc. But if I dive back to naive thinking, both paroxysm dysfunction and uh, lysosome disorder kind of work as waste disposal, disposal system in different manner sense, but how much would paroxysm dysfunction also uh, evolve into neurodegenerative disease compared to lysosome? Is there like a bigger role, smaller role, or are they related? Yeah, I think the paroxysomes are, are understudied um, in this, and also, of course, paroxysomes are also forming contact sites and are very important for cell biology more broadly. And the number of people who work on paroxysomes worldwide is very, very small compared to the number of people who are working on lysosomes. So I suspect that we are missing a lot of information about the interaction between, you know, how functional, you know, these, in many of these lysosomal diseases, these lipids, not in neiman C because of the block in trafficking and fusion so much, but in the other lysosomal diseases, a lot of these, these stored lipids get out of the lysosome and start accumulating in other membranes of other organelles. And it could well be the case that while the lipid is confined to the lysosome, the cell is actually fairly functional still, but when it starts getting out, particularly into the ER, these lipids, because they partition into the membrane, they start affecting calcium channels and other ion channels and modulating their function, and then you upset cell signaling. So I think we've never really yet taken a really holistic look at, you know, looking systematically at lysosomes, mitochondria, peroxisomes in a single model system. Uh, but I think that they, they are certainly important. And I think in Parkinson's, the fundamental question is if heterozygosity of a lysosomal disease gene is a risk, why is the dopaminergic system vulnerable to 
a heterozygous mutation when most parents of lysosomal disease children are functional and normal? What is it about aging and being heterozygous for one of these mutations? And it may be that the sort of energy metabolism of the dopaminergic system and sort of lipid turnover in those cells is on much more of a knife edge than other neuronal populations. And so we found in a, we published recently a study, which I didn't have time to go into today, but we've looked in the context of Parkinson's at what happens to lysosomal function in normal individuals, both human and rodents with aging, and several lysosomal enzymes decline as we age. And if you look in Parkinson's patients, they just have a more extreme version of that. So you could imagine we're looking at the moment at whether or not circulating glycosphingolipids might be biomarkers for stratifying patients into whether they're at risk of, of Parkinson's and also for monitoring progression. Um, so I think there's a lot we're going to learn from the Parkinson's field about, you know, what is it about certain populations of neurons that need almost 100% enzyme capacity in the lysosomal system. Um, so it's a real conundrum because you know, for a, for a true lysosomal disease, both copies of the gene have to be defective. Whereas in, in uh, Parkinson's, you've only got to have one mutant allele. And to be able to capture the changes, would, would it have to be sampling on the brain or would be, can we capture that in a plasma sample? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the, the nice thing is that the, um, what was very convenient from an experimental point of view is that when you have a change in lysosomal enzyme expression, it seems to happen in every tissue of the body. So if you have a declining enzyme with age, you can look at it in lymphoid tissue, you can look at it in, uh, you can look at the consequences of it in plasma. And what we did uh, to validate this was that we looked in Parkinson's patients where we had post-mortem substantia nigra that we could measure enzymes and glycolipid levels. We had CSFs, which we could measure the lipid levels in, and we have plasma where we could measure the lipids. And they, the changes correlated very well. So I think you absolutely can use um, you know, peripheral body fluids as a way of having an indication of what's going on in the central nervous system in terms of lysosomal decline, which will be really helpful because it, it you know, we, if, if we have treatments on the horizon uh, from any route for Parkinson's, how you stratify those patients for trials will be really important for the likelihood of success. We also looked at prodromal patients who had um, REM sleep disorder and they had an even more extreme version of these changes. Obviously, they don't have any degeneration yet. Uh, and we saw a really strong signal in those individuals as well. So I think it is valid. Thank you so much. Great. If there aren't any more questions, um, I'd like to share a little bit about our next speaker next month. Uh, let me go ahead and um, share my screen. Again, thank you, Dr. Platt, for such a wonderful talk. It was very enlightening, and we definitely learned a lot. We're very much interested in lysosomal um, specific lipids and disorders, so that's uh, something that, you know, I'm sure a lot of uh, folks from the Fiend Lab have learned something about that. Um, just quickly here, so our next speaker is going to be Jennifer, uh, Dr. Jennifer, Doc, uh, Jennifer Broadbelt from University of Texas Austin. Uh, she's the professor and chairperson of the chemistry department there at University of Texas, and uh, Dr. Broadbelt group really focuses on development and application of mass spectrometry to a ver variety of biological problems, specifically with the use of photo dissociation, such as UVPD. Um, again, this is something we're also learning about, so much interest to the Fiend Lab, but it should be a great talk to learn uh, about something, you know, in terms of other uh, analytical applications to learn about lipidomics, for example, in the talk um, on May 11th. Again, please register and uh, thank you again, Dr. Platt, for such a great talk. It was a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Great, great. to meet you all. Thank you. Thank you.